um, even Skype. Yeah, Facebook messaging. That's what they're going into. They don't go into email because of the, uh, what you call this, interface. With Facebook messaging, it just pops up. And then you just um, click, and then you see the message. With email, it's a bit longer, more steps. So the younger people prefer something quicker. So a lot of happening, a lot of things are happening within 60 seconds. Uh, 600 plus new videos are uploaded. 60 seconds. That's a lot. Okay, and so on. Now in Malaysia, since most of us here are Malaysians and I'm a Malaysian, our population, okay, it's changed a bit to 28 million, but uh, uh, it says here about 65% of Malaysians are on the internet. Okay, 65% of Malaysians are on the internet. And the top five social media channels are, number one, Facebook, Yahoo, Blogspot. What's this one? Microsoft. Live.com. Okay, and then the last one is MSN. Yeah, MSN. MSN Messenger. So what do we see here? 75.5% of the internet users are on Facebook. Now, you just said earlier that almost all students are on Facebook, yeah? So the younger people are a lot more in there. Now, again, this is another uh, link to a video that captured what students said about Facebook use uh, for their research. It's a very interesting uh, comment, yeah? These are teenagers. And uh, trends, uh, Tony Driscoll, a professor of business administration at Duke University, this is what he says. The stale passive lecture model is being replaced by a more dynamic way of teaching and learning one in which students and instructors collaborate in a give and take fashion to make meaning together. So it is social constructivist learning. How many of us are doing that now? It's not q and It is students contributing to each other's opinions, uh, sharing of knowledge, examples, and so on. So we have not quite reached that stage yet, but I think we will. There are other documents if you want to read. I mean, there are thousands of documents. I just picked a few among the latest ones. Use of Google Docs, okay? If you know Google Docs, okay, how do you use it for teaching and learning? Can you imagine it? Because that's collaborative work, right? If you have a team project, you could use Google Docs. Or any other tool. I mean, Google Docs is just one example here. Facebook as a learning tool. Okay, here is what I like to do. I join among many groups, well, not, not to say many, several groups, um, this particular uh, learning community. It's called Educators Using Facebook. I did not set this up, I just joined it. And um, you, get, you get interesting information from here. Great tools to teach about the human body. I guess for medical, stu for medical students that would make sense. The best teaching is personal. Yeah, this is what you're saying now, personalized learning. Different students have different forms of learning, although they're enrolled in the same course or are taught by the same person. Everything is personalized, yeah? When you have that pool model, then it becomes personalized. And Twitter cheat sheet. If you want to know how um, to use Twitter, I mean, so, many, so many ideas that you can get on the internet. Uh, Self-learning environment, uh, all kinds, yeah? Okay, that's just one example. So you can put in many things, newspaper articles, slides. Um, 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 Dr. Abdul Rahman talked about second life for business, yeah? Uh, peer evaluation, um, I mean, there was just a message uh, for them. But uh, we could share many things with each other through Facebook and it becomes a real nice learning experience and very interactive. And there was a creation of a new term called modipodding. Is it continued to be used? Modipodding, Safia? And Sapo uh, Yang Kiretni, T, T's group, modipodding. I'm not sure whether that's gone on. 
And uh, so we can talk about assignment as well. I mean, the message. Uh, what's a common scenario? So another lecturer shared what he found. Okay, a lot. I think over one month, I think. Yeah. And then QR codes, and I saw a paper on QR. Christine introduced QR in this uh, session. Okay, I think Pon Kamara and Chit Ripen are also, were also in this book. So was not on Facebook yet at that time, so I wasn't able to invite. Okay, so that's an example. Uh, this one, uh, this one I created. So we have uh, academicians from around the world who are members of this uh, discussion group or Facebook group. We focus, we try to focus on tablets. It started with iPads, but actually because the Samsung Galaxy Note and all that were also very popular, so then um, we went into other, we covered uh, iPads and um, tablets in general rather than iPads. So, but then, yeah, we can discuss videos and whatnot, yeah, so many things. Okay, so yeah, South Korean school textbooks will be all digital. And recently when I was in Thailand, there was a seminar um, of a uh, seminar that gathered 200 plus teachers in the northern region of Thailand to share their stories about iPad use in the schools. The Ministry of Education in Thailand gives every year one student an iPad. No, sorry, not an iPad, a tablet. Their tablet, I saw it, it's all in Thai. So the lessons, the, 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 the um, yeah, if you want to call that lessons or activities are in time. So they created uh, for their young. I don't think I heard anything about the Ministry of Education doing anything similar. Not yet, yeah? Okay, of course, uh, iPad use in the classroom. The minute we have the tablets, so many things can happen, yeah? With social media, it's just like that, ubiquitous. Now, this is an interesting uh, learning environment quadrant. You have formal and informal learning, intentional and unexpected learning. Just look at how things are, I mean, just look at what things are mentioned in there. You don't see lectures in there, do you? You see classes, but classes, meetings, yeah, face to face. But you also see e-learning because it could be formal and intentional. Yeah, it's not just, they don't talk about lectures, yeah? they talk about uh, self-study, reading, coaching, mentoring, um, then of course the communities, you know, what do you do, you explore together, you play together, yeah? Social media is one of them for formal unexpected learning. Because with social media, you can start with the foundation, but you don't know where the learning goes or where the learning will end, yeah? You don't know where. And that's why assess, it is a difficult situation. What do you assess if you don't know where the learning is going? So does it mean that we have to change our assessment? It's not con content-based. Maybe it shouldn't be content-based anymore. Maybe it should be uh, based on skills, analysis, for example. Okay, student engagement is a very important terminology among educators, especially in higher education more so in primary or secondary education. If students are not engaged, they are not going to be paying attention to the teacher or on the subject. They won't do their activities. They will not do their homework because they are not engaged. So that's why what they're saying now in the literature is that if the students are not engaged, they will not finish the course or they will drop out of the program. That's what happens. So if we engage them, they will stay the course. What does it mean? One definition that's been offered by Appleton, Christensen, and Furlong is that engagement has two or three components, such as positive conduct, effort, and participation yeah, on the part of the students. They put in their effort because they want to. They're engaged. They participate because they want to. Even if you give marks, some of them are not going to do it if, not, if they don't think they want to do it. Yeah. They don't necessarily do it. Some people do, some people don't. Another definition by Chen, Gonya, and Ku defines engagement as the degree to which learners are involved with their educational activities, and that engagement is positive linked to desired outcomes, high grades, student satisfaction, and perseverance. So if our students are falling behind, 
It could be because they are not engaged. If our students have dropped out, it could be because they were not engaged or we couldn't engage them. And um, if I were to just put a macro view to this, one of the factors that will engage learners and learning, it's a learner-friendly environment. Learner-friendly environment. We think of the learners first, what they want, what they need. And a supportive learning community. Notice the word community. So it's supportive of what they need to do, how they, how they need to learn, the materials that they need to learn. Okay, then we'll get that student engagement. Once you get student engagement, everything works, will work well. All right, I've used Ning. I, I experimented with it. Ning is actually not for courses. It was more for informal learning. So usually associations had it. Yeah, associations, organizations, yeah. Uh, but what I did was try to use it for a course at OEM. It was a master's course. I, I think this one was two years ago or one and a half years ago. And we had, what I liked was, I could see all the students' pictures. All in one go. Because this is, a, this is a totally online course and the students are from all over the world. You don't see them, you don't meet them. And I was like, hey, it's not nice. You know, you don't see how they look like. So when Ning forces people, encourages people to put a photo or upload their photo, so that was nice. And you can create, you know, personalize the, the Ning in such a way that there's a welcome message. It's whatever you put, whatever you design, yeah? It comes empty, yeah? It comes empty. And uh, then you just design in such a way that there's a place for everything, okay? And then the next semester, we only had five students. And I was so worried, actually, at the start of the semester, how am I going to work with five students? Am I going to be doing a lot more of the discussions, I thought. But you know what? When you design the activity correctly, the students will come in. And they wrote one A4 size page of opinions, examples, yeah? Master students, yeah? So you post the right issues, they come with all the right, um, you know, uh, now this one was in the beginning of the semester, so there were not that many pictures yet. But that was for another course. Now I don't use Ning anymore because we were told that we have to use LMS only. So okay, i gone into LMS. Um, now this one, 21st century learning. Uh, okay, what I wanted to show was there are new tools recently. This is called Scoop It. Scoop, yeah, you scoop. You curate, yeah? You curate all the scoops that you need. And uh, I focus on learning 21st century, so every time I see something nice to read or refer to, I scoop it. And so it appears on my Scoop It page. So that's a nice tool to use too, you know, for, for assignments later on or for projects. There's another page which I like, and incidentally, Pinterest is going very fast also now. So you will see this more and more later on. Um, Pin interest allows you to do the same thing like Scoop It, except it's more visual oriented. And once you click in here, you can see the story or the website. But in addition, you are able to make to, to put in your comments, to type in your comments at the bottom, just like Facebook. So then you become it becomes interactive. Of course, there are theories or theories to support the various. Um, what you call these quadrants. If you talk about environment, it could be passive or it could be active. If you talk about the learner, the learner could be active or passive. And these are the theories from before. They didn't know what was coming yeah, with the internet and all, but their theories fitted in very well in, each, in either one of these quadrants or more than one of the quadrants. So I'm just, I just found this. I won't be able to elaborate with examples, but um, this is basically, when you see Vygotsky, it's social constructivist learning, which most of us are only starting to get into. Um, it used to be teaching of content, okay? We teach and the students will gain knowledge, understanding, skill and experience. But are we sure that they are doing that? They are, they are able to gain all that? How about if we engage, yeah? That is where I'm coming to. With uh, social media, the potential of engaging students in using content. Of course, you have to design your, your um, course in such a way that this happens. Yeah? You have problem solving and challenging solutions for them. 
uh, challenging situations for them, where you engage students with the content. So we don't focus on teaching content, let some other medium do that. Uh, what we do is we engage them with the content that they've got. And we will be able to personalize the learning and we'll be able to provide meaningful learning. The same outcome is the same. The, the outcome is the same. Okay, the three W's. It used to be three R's. Now the three W's. You learn whatever, whenever, wherever. It's a new set of literacies called digital citizenship. What is digital citizenship? Now you'll find variations of what digital citizenship means, but this is one list. Finding information, validating the information that you find, synthesizing it, leveraging it, communicating it, collaborating with it, problem solve it, reflect about it, evaluate it, publish it. This is what the students will do, yeah? And look at the setting. Not many classrooms are designed like this. So from before, can we have this kind of situation? With the technology there. Oh, you M Bolea, Pramanso? Pramanso, uh, program this is okay, right? <laughs> anyway, when you have uh, this kind of situation, more flexible, more interactive, more collaborative, this will happen. I mean, among other things, authentic learning, you know, when you provide problem-based learning or project-based learning, you encourage collaborative learning, but you must set, it, set this up, you must design it. Borderless learning. One day, okay, let me just show you another story. How many of you heard of Coursera? Coursera, some of you have. Now, I was, I enrolled in a few Coursera courses because I thought, okay, it's time for me to learn something different. So I enrolled in some. The first course I enrolled, now what was it called? It was a long time ago, I mean many months ago, sometime last June, I think it started. Um, I can't remember what the name of the course is because I didn't finish it, you know? <laughs> because it was not compulsory, right? I thought, okay, let me just try. What happened was, in the first week itself of entering the course, because when they opened, you go in, I found out that there were 80,000 students enrolled in that one course. 80,000 students from 100 over countries, almost 200 countries. And what happened also within the same one or two days yeah, after going in, you found Facebook groups being set up by different students from around the world. So you go into the one that you like, and there will be hundreds in that Facebook group to discuss what the, the lecturer has just discussed to discuss what the lecturer has just asked to read. Okay, so that's borderless learning. People from all over the world in one place. And of course, nowadays, uh, there's also this concept of bring your own device. It's, it's commonly talked about in the US. Bring your own device, your tablet, your smartphone, yeah, to school. And then the teacher will have things designed. Okay, we talked about student engagement. And uh, there is this one course from the Sloan Consortium um, called Like This, Tweet That, Engaging Students Through Social Media. See how important social media is, how important engaged learning is, or student engagement is. Sloan Consortium is the leader for e-learning. And of course, we also hear very often now, ubiquitous learning. It is a way of the future to be. Because once you have your own device, it's 24-7. We talk about access. We talk about uh, the ease of use. We talk about anytime, anywhere. And what was the other one, the, the W just now? Where, wherever, whenever, and whatever. Okay, yeah, I, you learned. <laughs> All right, I'm almost ending. This is what Confucius says, or said, every truth has four corners. As a teacher, I give you one corner, and it is you to find the other three. So you don't spoon feed, right? Okay, I would like to leave you with more questions, because questions are the answers, yeah? What has our role been as educators to leverage on the success and ubiquity of the internet? How are we helping our students to learn? Are we able to engage 
our students? And have we become a true facilitator of learning? You know, the first time I heard the word facilitator was when, was in 1975, when I was part of a group sent by the Malaysian government to go overseas, and we were supposed to come back as school teachers, our MRSM teachers. And uh, <clears throat> the person who was briefing us said, you are not going to become teachers. When you come back, you are going to become facilitators at MRSM. That was the first time I heard the word facilitator, 1975. But it wasn't until lately that I saw that role actually happening. Because most of the time, you're still teaching. Yeah? It's so difficult to get away from that role. We think we are the master of the subject matter, and we want to teach. Otherwise, we, we, we think we didn't do our job. And I remember also at the International Medical University, because their style was problem-based learning, which made up for a significant amount of their learning time yeah, of these medical students. And I remember stu uh, students complaining. Now, we paid a lot of money. It's like 20-something thousand or 30-something thousand, almost 10,000 US per semester. And they said, how come you're not being taught? How come we have to do the, le the learning? You know, it's problem-based learning, right? You have to research, yeah? Given the issue, given the scenario, you're supposed to go, go research, you know, about the medical, um, well, then you have to research about human anatomy, human physiology and all that, then come back to the table and discuss. Okay, it's not to solve the problem, but is it, what is it that you need to know before you can decide what to do with this patient? So that kind of students at that time, yeah, in the 19, before I came into OUM, uh, 2004, uh, 2000 to 2003, I was there, um, and um, they were complaining, why aren't we being taught? But today it's been accepted, yeah, problem-based learning. And I think an engineering school in UM also has gone into problems.